Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and in this video, the third of digging deeply into Delta file logs, we're going to do the final pass, a deeper dive, because the heart of Delta Lake is, in fact, the Delta logs. Before I jump in, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where you get access to me, specialized content, and more. So, in part three, one thing I want to start with is I did point out a blog earlier that you can reference, and that blog is here. And it does give a nice explanation of kind of conceptually what's happening here. Now, one thing I'm going to be talking about now is something called checkpoint files. So let's take a look at what those are and why they matter. Now, before we can poke around in some of this, it's a good idea to put this setting into place here, which stops essentially Databricks from blocking us from looking at some of these files directly. Now, I already ran this part of the code. And I mentioned before, I don't like to run it again because all the files get renamed and shifted around. It really creates new files with new names. It gets really confusing. So I'm going to just show you what I did and walk through it without running everything again. But one of the things I wanted to do was trigger at least break over 10 transaction log file entries. Why is that? I'll explain in a minute. But I did that with just a bunch of update statements. Each update, notice it ends with a semicolon, is really a separate transaction, which means it will get a separate delta log file. So running these alone, I should get 11, and I've already done a couple of transactions that I did in my previous video, so we should break the magic 10 number. So let's take a look here. So by doing a file system command and listing the log files, we can see all of the different log files here. The JSON file is the one that matter, the .json. The CRC are just check digits. They really don't matter for our purposes. It's just making sure things were copied correctly. What I want to really point out here is when you get to the 10th, JSON file, the 10th log file, you're going to get something new. It's called checkpoint.parquet. What is that, Brian? Why are we getting that? What's happening there is Databricks is trying to introduce an optimization. These JSON files are really small files. And when you get a lot of them, if we end up with thousands and thousands of transactions, it's going to really be non performant for Databricks to try to sort out all these little files and make sense of them. So, what they did instead is every time you get to the 10th JSON file, Spark will consolidate the prior files and give you a current, what they call a checkpoint. Now, the takeaway is that when you get to this checkpoint file, Databricks can bypass all the JSON files that built up to it. And it will give you the current state as of that point in time of the Delta table you're looking at. And that's what uh, this blog actually tells you, right? It's going to say this what it, the checkpoint files save the entire state of the table as of a point in time. But they do it in a native parquet format. Why do we do it in a parquet format? Because think about it, parquet files can be spread around the cluster and they can be fairly large. So even if you do have quite a few parquet files, Databricks is going to grab them all, throw them on the cluster, and then it's going to use the cluster as a way to parse through what it needs to do to get to a particular table. And if you're looking for, say, the current state, then it's going to go to the latest version of the checkpoint file. And if there are any other, it might be a handful of other transactions applied, it can just grab the latest parquet file, add the few different JSONs to it, and it's good to go. That's a lot better than trying to go through all of these JSON files since the beginning of time to build out what you need to see. So that's what's going on with these files. Just to kind of take a look at this for a minute, I have this function here we did earlier, and I just want to repaste it here for a couple of reasons. One, we don't have, and the one I'm going to look at, this log does not have a fourth entry. So I commented that part out. And by having it here, you can run the cell here and not have to go back up to the top of the notebook and run everything. Now we have our log file and the path of JSON. And I did a show log here and the usual stuff you can see. So what I'm trying to do here is this is the 10th JSON file. So we do get a JSON file. But then what's interesting is so you have this. And OK, so what I did in each of these update statements, I'm going to say update dim sales territory and set the sales territory alternate key to 99. It's always going to go to 99 there, but then I have it going from where the sales territory key is one or two or three. So you know what it's going to generally be doing is updating that particular column. We can see that's what it's doing here. And because we're doing an update, we see the old file being removed and then the new file, the one with the update being added. So it's really just probably going to have a single row in that particular activity. What does the parquet file itself look like? Again, I copied this here so we can see this is just going to display our. Now, this we had been using this function to display the actual data files, but now I'm going to use it to display the parquet checkpoint file. And we can see this is our data path. 
we did our function above to display it. And I want to show you, I'm not even going to try to make sense totally of this. I poked around, couldn't totally figure out how this works, <laughs> to be honest. But if I go to, down to the bottom, I can scroll better. You can scroll over here. And the most important thing you can see essentially is it's it's got to remove and then add. Okay, So add is on this side and remove is on this side. It's basically a matter of that, right? Because it's adding certain files and taking away other files. And that's how it determines what it needs to do. The other thing I noticed is if you scroll over this way, you can see that it has at the top a protocol definition. So it's saying what was the protocol used in these transactions. And then it has the metadata for your table. Other than that, it's, it looks like it's just a bunch of add files, remove files. And somehow it magically will use that to get to the state of the data you require. So the takeaway on that is really just you've got all these little JSON files being created for every little transaction you do. On every 10th transaction, Databricks is going to consolidate that and create a parquet file, which gives you a snapshot of where the table is at that point in time. Not a lot in this video, but I do want to talk about some crucial things you need to know, some of which I don't think I've mentioned yet. So let's mention, first of all, that there are differences between your good old Delta Lake log tables or your Delta logs versus something like a SQL database uh, counterpart. Delta tables are really parquet files that have some special services wrapped around them, like a few features that work within a framework, namely the Delta log that we've talked a lot about, and then the idea that we can insert, change, and delete get things done with those. And that's kind of hidden by manipulating the Delta log. And then within the service, it splits up parquet files and rearranges them so that it can keep generating different versions of the parquet file. And now it's called a Delta table. And so we have a versioning history for doing that. Table metadata is stored in the log. So that's kind of interesting too. Typically, if you were thinking of like a SQL Server Oracle, you have metadata being stored in catalog tables, right? Information schema generally keeps it there. And the logs are really there to track what's been updated, what's inserted, deleted, but not tracking so much the metadata. That's handled more within the catalogs. The log files are needed by Databricks to assemble the table to a current state or a prior version, if you want. That's not the way we think of relational database logs typically. Usually we're thinking with those, it's more of a recovery purpose. You know, we do an update, we do a delete, we do things, and something goes wrong and we say, oh, we have to get back to a state of where we were, a good state of data. Uh, sometimes database, somebody unplugged the server or something in the middle, something went wrong. And what would happen is they'll bring a backup and the logs will actually give you the transactions so you can apply them until you get back to a good state. That's mostly the purpose of having the log file itself. That and the fact that you could be halfway into a transaction and you say, oh, wait, I don't want to do this. And you can back it off. But they're much more central to Delta tables. Something that may not have been obvious, but is worth pointing out, I think, is there really is no row level logging when you talk about delta tables. It's more simulated because if you look at it, it's always dealing with an entire file. I do some sort of transaction and it adds a file and then maybe deletes a file, but it's not actually looking at individual rows. In fact, when you did the first giant insert, what did it really do? It just created a parquet file, so it added one file. And then later on, it's splitting up files, but that's how it really is operating at a file level. Now I've experienced this in my own work, so I wanna point it out, which is locking can occur when two or more processes try to change the data at the same time. This is similar to what can happen in a relational database. One person goes after a record, another person goes after it, they both try to commit their change at the same time, and the database has to say no, one of these has to fail. That can happen with Databricks too, it can happen with Delta tables. They don't talk about it a lot, but it can happen. And it will happen the most when you're working on the same area within a table. That's when it's most likely to happen. Because if you're trying to work on the same partition, you're likely to get locking. Bottom line is, Delta tables are not designed for high update concurrency. Oh my God, what does that mean? It means if you have a table and you have a lot of different users that want to make updates, delete changes to that single table at once, it's not going to work so well. Now, that isn't necessarily such a big problem because we're talking about data warehouses. And in a data warehouse, especially something with Databricks, where it's probably petabytes of data or at least terabytes, you're probably not going to be getting into the same space at the same time. Typically, you'll have a process that is updating a single table. And even if it's streaming, it's doing it in a more linear way. Now, if you had a lot of different streams coming in from different places and they weren't going in in a sequential manner, you could end up with some locking. If you have web applications and they're all trying to update something in the same table at the same time, 
you can get locking. But in a warehouse application, it's usually a lot less of a problem. If you were trying to use Delta tables to do like online transaction processes, it's good old OLTPs, type of transaction system, you might run into some trouble. But that's not really the niche that Databricks is trying to go for. Now, I had this happen because I was creating a table and I was using it as an audit log. And I did get it to work, but I had to partition by the subject area so that when I was going after pieces, it wasn't trying to update the same part of my audit log at the same time. So it can cause some issues. And when it does, what I ended up doing was just trapping that it locked and then creating a random number of seconds to wait and then try again. As long as it's not high throughput, in my case, it wasn't. It was just kind of a logging in a batch mode. I was able to get away with that. And a key thing to bear in mind, this is something that relational databases can do without a problem, but you cannot do a Delta log at least at this time. And that is you cannot do multi-table transactions. So you'll notice that all the stuff I've showed you is we're updating, you know, sales territory, not updating sales territory and a customer and a salesperson and a region doing it to one table at a time. That is a bit of a limitation. But it's, uh, I think, a lot tied to the scaled out architecture. It's really difficult to try to do all these different tables at the same time. Again, if you were in an online transactional processing situation where you said, I've got a customer coming in and I want to do the customer insert at the same time, I'm going to commit a sales transaction to the customer, you might want to wrap that up together. But in a data warehousing world, typically these things happen really separately. You're taking data in and you're saying load it in. And you do typically do it one table at a time. So that's it for this time. Please like, share, subscribe. I hope you find this useful. Tell your friends. And until next time, I'm Paul and Fire. We're all in this together. Thank you.